sometimes ignorance is preferable to the detailed truth. Maybe, we only care about truth in so far as it empowers us, knowing and thinking about all of the details of every orange tree would just be a psychological burden for the most of us. I'll take illusion over the reality but can't help but ask, is it possible that the mind is actually accessing a deeper kind of truth? Maybe, the mind is separating the signal from the noise. But what constitutes signal versus noise? Our values. A farmer that values knowing all the details of an orange tree will view it differently than a regular person. Well, where do our values come from? Here's Nietzsche's view from beyond good and evil, behind all logic and its seeming sovereignty of movement, there too stand valuations or, more clearly, physiological demands for the preservation of a certain type of life. For Nietzsche, our values come from our physiological demands, and what does our physiology demand? Power. It wants to survive and thrive. What does it mean to thrive? To imagine the world a certain way and to be able to make that illusion a reality. Someone could try to contest this idea by saying that they don't seek power or want to thrive, they won't eat or drink anything to prove this point. But, they would still be seeking a kind of power, they imagine a world in which they prove the idea wrong and they seek to bring that world into fruition, even at their own expense. So then begs the question, what if we cover the entire desert with solar panels? How much energy would we actually be able to produce, and how would this change our planet? Let's take a deep dive. For starters, let's begin here. This is the Where's That Solar Power Station in Morocco, the world's largest concentrated solar power plant currently in existence in a marvel of modern engineering. Once fully completed and operational, the plant will take up an area of 25 square kilometers and be capable of producing 582 megawatts of electricity. It will even be capable of storing solar energy in the form of superheated molten salt, which allows for further production of electricity even into the night. After investing more than $9 billion into their solar energy objective, Morocco aims to create four additional plants similar to this one in the Sahara that will collectively create more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity production, which will be enough to provide for roughly 38% of all of Morocco's annual electricity needs. This project will transform Morocco into the world's leading solar energy state, 
And as the only African country that currently has a power cable link to Europe, much of this energy will be exported for profit to the countries of the European Union. An ant is pretty stupid. It doesn't have much of a brain, no will, no plan, and yet, many ants together are smart. An ant colony can construct complex structures. Some colonies keep farms of fungi, others take care of cattle. They can wage war or defend themselves. How is this possible? How can a bunch of stupid things do smart things together? This phenomenon is called emergence and it's one of the most fascinating and mysterious features of our universe. In a nutshell, it describes small things forming bigger things that have different properties than the sum of their parts. Emergence is complexity arising from simplicity, and emergence is everywhere. Water has vastly different properties to the molecules that make it up, like the concept of wetness. Take wet fabric, if you zoom in far enough, there is no wetness. There are just molecules sitting in the spaces between the atoms of the cloth. Wetness is an emerging property of water. Something new only created by a lot of individual interactions between water molecules, and this is sort of it. Many things interact under a certain set of rules, creating something above and beyond themselves. Wetness is an emerging property of water. Something new only created by a lot of individual interactions between water molecules. And this is sort of it. Many things interact under a certain set of rules, creating something above and beyond themselves. But for these things that we actually do really care about and do experience profound regret around, what does that experience feel like? We all know the short answer. It feels terrible. Regret feels awful. But it turns out that regret feels awful in four very specific and consistent ways. So, the first consistent component of regret is basically denial. When I went home that night after getting my tattoo, I basically stayed up all night. And for the first several hours, there was exactly one thought in my head. And the thought was, make it go away. This is an unbelievably primitive emotional response. Mean, it's right up there with, I want my mommy. We're not trying to solve the problem.
But for these things that we actually do really care about and do experience profound regret around, what does that experience feel like? We all know the short answer. It feels terrible. Regret feels awful. But it turns out that regret feels awful in four very specific and consistent ways. So, the first consistent component of regret is basically denial. When I went home that night after getting my tattoo, I basically stayed up all night. And for the first several hours, there was exactly one thought in my head. And the thought was, make it go away. This is an unbelievably primitive emotional response. Mean, it's right up there with, I want my mommy. We're not trying to solve the problem. We're not trying to understand how the problem came about. We just want it to vanish. The second characteristic component of regret is a sense of bewilderment. So, the other thing thought about there in my bedroom that night was, how could have done that? What was thinking? This real sense of alienation from the part of us that made a decision we regret. We can't identify with that part. We don't understand that part. And we certainly don't have any empathy for that part, which explains the third consistent component of regret, which is an intense desire to punish ourselves. That's why, in the face of our regret, the thing we consistently say is, I could have kicked myself. The fourth component here is that regret is what psychologists call perseverative. To perseverate means to focus obsessively and repeatedly on the exact same thing. Now the effect of perseveration is to basically take these first three components of regret and put them on an infinite loop. So, it's not that I sat there in my bedroom that night, thinking, make it go away. It's that I sat there and I thought, make it go away. Make it go away. Make it go away. Make it go away. So, if you look at the psychological literature, these are the four consistent defining components of regret. But if we're to ask you a similar question, what percentage of the population do you think is capable of truly mastering calculus, or understanding organic chemistry, or, or being able to contribute to, to cancer research? A lot of you might say, well, with a great education system, maybe 20, 30 percent. But what if that estimate is just based on your own experience in a non-mastery framework, your own experience with yourself or observing your peers? where you're being pushed at this set pace through classes, accumulating all these gaps. Even when you got that 95%, what was that 5% you missed? 
and it keeps accumulating all the way you get to an advanced class, all of a sudden you hit a wall and say, I'm not meant to be a cancer researcher, not meant to be a physicist, not meant to be a mathematician. Now, why are companies embracing the re-entry internship? Because the internship allows the employer to base their hiring decision on an actual work sample instead of a series of interviews and the employer does not have to make that permanent hiring decision until the internship period is over. This testing out period removes the perceived risk that some managers attach to hiring relaunchers and they are attracting excellent candidates who are turning into great hires. Think about how far we have come. Before this, most employers were not interested in engaging with relaunchers at all. But now, not only are programs being developed specifically with relaunchers in mind, but you can't even apply for these programs unless you have a gap on your resume. This is the mark of real change of true institutional shift, because if we can solve this problem for relaunchers we can solve it for other career transitioners too. In fact, an employer just told me that their Veterans Return to Work program is based on their re-entry internship program, and there's no reason why there can't be a retiree internship program. Different pool, same concept. This kind of approach is kind of the way some students approach preparing for standardized tests. In order to get test scores to go up, teachers will end up teaching to the test. Now, that approach can work, test results often do go up. But it fails the fundamental goal of education, to prepare students to succeed over the long term. So given these obstacles, what can we do to transform the way we transform organizations? So rather than being exhausting, it's actually empowering and energizing? To do that, we need to focus on five strategic imperatives, all of which have one thing in common, putting people first. The first imperative for putting people first is to inspire through purpose. Most transformations have financial and operational goals. These are important and they can be energizing to leaders, but they tend not to be very motivating to most people in the organization. To motivate more broadly, the transformation needs to connect with a deeper sense of purpose. Take Lego. The Lego Group has become an extraordinary global company. Under their very capable leadership, they've actually undergone a series of transformations. While each of these has had a very specific focus, the North Star, linking and guiding all of them, has been Lego's powerful purpose, inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Expanding globally? It's not about increasing sales, but about giving millions of additional children access to Lego building bricks.
So, the idea I'd like to propose today is this, one of the most effective ways of building strong fundamentals in students and preparing them for the future, ironically enough is by looking to the past through the teaching of Latin. Latin will help students think more logically, communicate more effectively and have a more comprehensive understanding of the world around them, no matter how technologically advanced that world may become. To begin with, let's address a common misconception that Latin is a dead language spoken by ancient European 2000 years ago, holding no relevance whatsoever for people living in the 21st century. There's even an old poem that expresses the point of view. Latin is a language, as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. Now students may feel this way sometimes but the this simply is not true, the reality is that Latin never died, and never came to a crashing end with the death of a single tragic figure. Likewise, you can even physically hurt people in a coma, and they will remain completely oblivious and unresponsive. In times not too distant past, this was sometimes used as treating, with doctors trying to shock their victims back into consciousness. Everything was tried from exposing parts of the body to open flames, to severely dropping the body's temperature with ice, to even bloodletting from the head directly. One treatment even included wholly emptying the stomach. We guess because the doctors thought that if a patient got hungry enough, the body would force them to wake up, or maybe they really were just throwing everything including the kitchen sink at the problem, which we're sure was also tried. Comas can occur as a result of serious trauma or as a deliberate medical treatment by doctors. They are typically brought on by traumatic head injury, and it's believed that it's the brain's way of shutting down so it can focus on repairing itself. They can also however be brought on by a stroke, a brain tumor, drug or alcohol abuse, or an illness such as diabetes or an infection. Most of the time a coma only lasts a few weeks though, but past this period the patient can enter a persistent vegetative state that severely lessens their chances of ever coming back out of one. 